Um, good evening to all. Um, I remember when I was president of the bank, I used to introduce my statements by saying that I wasn't sure whether it was uh, an address, a brief statement, or something else. Uh, and in a sense, I, I face a similar dilemma. I, when I was telephoned by Carrie Cornet um, about this function, I readily agreed that I would participate. Um, and she said um, it was set to celebrate or commemorate Sir Arthur's 100th birthday. And then the next day I called and said, what do you, and I think I spoke to um, Mrs. Murrell, yeah, the secretary, and said, but do you realize that his birthday is in January? So why are you celebrating it in November? And then she explained to me that it was part of a program in association with the University of the West Indies. But no one let on to me how elaborate this whole thing was. But they asked if I could speak about my association, my work in with Saath in the early years of the bank. And this is what I will try to do. Anyhow, let me begin more formally in, my, in the mode of addressing. And, and I, I wish to adopt all the salutations that President Smith used, except excluding myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is a great pleasure and honor to have been asked to participate um, on this occasion. I do not propose to give, um, to pay tribute to Sir Arthur in the way that some have done. I have done that on a number of occasions in the past, but on, on this occasion, I. I certainly, it's, it's not meant to forget or not to recognize the great contribution that he has made and all the accomplishments that he, of his. And in fact, he always said that he got tired of being referred to as the first in everything, the first person to do this, the first black man to achieve this. He just wanted to continue on what he was doing. So I'm not going that route this evening. But I just wanted to, uh, in fact, I didn't even know what the title of my address or my statement or whatever it is was to be until I saw this evening its reflections on Sir William Arthur Lewis. And in fact, that's what I had planned to do. I first met Sir Arthur in the early 1950s, when I was a student at Cambridge between 1952 and 55, where I was reading for a degree in economics. And recently, at um, a lecture, every year the Fair Trading Commission, of which I'm chairman, has a lecture, sponsors a lecture. And the CEO always addresses, uh, in introducing me, refers to me always as an attorney at law. So this last occasion, I had to remind her that I spent more time studying economics than I did law. <laughs> because I, I spent three years at Cambridge reading for economics, not necessarily always studying economics. <laughs> Whereas I... When I left Cambridge, when I graduated in 1955, I began to read for the bar in, seriously in October 1955. 
And I sat my finals in May 1957, was successful, and was called to the bar in July of that year. So that I actually spent less time studying law. That was real study. When you're reading, when you're doing the bar exams, that is serious study than I did reading economics, especially at Cambridge. But um, I mention this because during that time at Cambridge, there wasn't that much emphasis as far as I can recollect, but I'm talking about 60 years ago. Um, although one was aware of the works of Sir Arthur, the big debate in Cambridge economics mastered the modern technology, I assume. As I said, at that time, 1952 to 55, the big debate in Cambridge economic circles then was the continuing dispute between the Keynesians and the traditional classical economists. And um, so there wasn't much um, emphasis on development economics, which was just beginning. Um, so Arthur was, in fact, breaking ground in, in, in drawing attention to this new um, part of economics. Anyhow, I first met him when the West Indian, the Cambridge West Indian Students Association invited him to come and address its members, and he did. But that was a long time ago, and I can't really remember what he addressed us about, although I'm sure it must have been very interesting and inspiring. And, and there's a, a corollary to this, because there was a similar institution at Oxford. And, and in, in fact, my wife tells me that, because she is from Trinidad, and she was at Oxford at the time, that they had also invited the, West, the Oxford West Indian Students Association had also invited Sir Arthur to address them. And he came, I think, from Manchester and did. And when he returned to Manchester, he sent them an invoice to cover his travel expenses. And this kind of shook them up a bit because they'd never expected to have to meet that expense. But uh, apparently, in, uh, in correspondence with them, he made the point, if you wish to invite someone like me to address you, you have to be prepared to pay for it. It was a lesson he, he was, said he, he wanted to teach them, you know, a, le a, a lesson. I don't recall the issue of payment in those circumstances arising with the Cambridge West Indian Students Association. But I believe, I seem to remember that there had been a whip around among all the West Indian students to provide the funds to meet his expenses in advance. Whether that was um, because we took 
economics more seriously at Cambridge than laws at Oxford. <laughs> I wouldn't want to say. Anyhow, um, by October 1959, I left Cambridge in 55 and went to London to read for the bar. By October 1959, when Sir Arthur was, um, took up the appointment as principal of UCWI, as it then was, I was preparing to leave Jamaica, where I had been working since September 1957. And there's a bit of a background to that. When, as I was nearing the end of my studies in London, for the bar in London, I sent out, not formal applications, but through the then colonial office students section, I sent out indications of my availability to Barbados, to Jamaica, to Trinidad and Tobago. And the first reply I got was from Barbados, which said there were no suitable vacancies available <laughs> for someone like me, which was apparently I found out afterwards when I did return to Barbados to, to take of an appointment there in 1960. That was a standard reply that was sent out to all Barbadian students, even those who'd gone abroad on government scholarships, as I had done. I was offered an appointment in Jamaica as an administrative cadet in their central planning unit, which at the time was headed by the late Arthur Brown. And George Cadbury was through the UNDP was the consultant advising, you know, helping with the setting up of that unit. And after I'd been in Jamaica for about three months, I got a reply from Trinidad, <laughs> which is in keeping with the pace at which they did things in Trinidad. And I don't think it had changed too much when I was present, when I was at CDB, because usually when you were having things like increases in capital, you could be sure that Trinidad was going to be the last member country to respond. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, um, as I said, I was about to leave Jamaica then to return to Barbados. In, the end of 59, um, to take up a post in the, as assistant legal draftsman in the Attorney General's office here in Barbados. In between, I was also going to, Trin <coughs> to Trinidad to get married um, in December of 59. I, so I never got the opportunity to meet with Sir Arthur again when he was at Mona. I do not think that I met him again until January 1970 at the inaugural meeting of CDB's Board of Governors. I was then on the Barbados delegation. That meeting was held in Nassau in the Bahamas where Sir Arthur had come to meet with Caribbean government representatives in order to finalize negotiations for the terms and conditions in connection with his possible election as the first president of CDB. One of the conditions that Sir Arthur was insistent on was that if he was, for him to accept the presidency, there would have to be an undertaking that no project could be put forward for consideration by the board of directors without a favorable recommendation from the president. The condition was eventually accepted by CDB's governors, who in turn requested that the president should keep the board of directors informed of the projects under consideration by the bank. At this early stage, even before he had formally taken up the position of president, 
I think it could be seen that Sir Arthur was seeking to ensure that CDB would be protected from political pressure in its lending operations. And in fact, when the bank, when I joined the bank, one of the things that Sir Arthur used to tell us about was that there were too many institutions in developing countries that had failed because of political pressure, especially financial institutions, because of political pressure on how they should make loans. And I think there's, I was talking to one of the CDB staff um, who works in the, the unit now which handles, which deals with the national development banks. And um, I was reminding him, the reason I remember this aspect of Sir Arthur's um, advice and and, and his insistence on ensuring that CDB should be, um, uh, as it were, um, isolated and insulated from political pressure in its operations, was that if you looked at the, if you look at national development banks throughout CDB's borrowing member countries, and I once made this point when I was given an address about development banking, that there's a pattern. These institutions never really get out of a difficult situation because when one party is in power, its supporters are sent to the development, the National Development Banks to get loans. And because of their political connections, they feel they don't have to repay or service these loans. And the bank, you know, bad loans and develop and contaminate the whole portfolio and the balance sheet. Then when there's a change in government, the new government sees that, makes sure that the development bank seeks to recover those old loans that were doing bad from those who are now opposition members our supporters, and then a new set of borrowers come in <laughs> with political connections who then start to do, who do the same thing, feeling that they don't have to service their loans. So while they're recovering bad loans from the last, from the first set, they're running up bad loans from the new set. So. It's this kind of circle of um, bad loans that bedevils the operations of the national development banks. Um, many persons think of Sir Arthur as a hard task master, and in many respects he was. But this was because he set very high standards and expected others to follow. Indeed, he often mentioned to me that one of the most disappointing and frustrating aspects of his tenure as principal of UCWI between 59 and 63 was the ease with which senior staff would undertake to do something by a particular deadline and then fail to deliver without any explanation, as if it didn't matter. And he always said, if I ask you to do something by a certain time and you don't think that it, that it can be reasonably accomplished in that time, well, let me know and I, I, I will understand, but don't tell me that you can do it and then when I expect you to deliver it, you, um, you, you tell me that you haven't finished as if it doesn't matter because I may have been depending on your input to do something else. On, on the other hand, Sir Arthur 
was always quick to offer praise when he felt that praise was due. And I can give you two examples of this in, in which I was involved. In, in the very early years of the bank's operations, um, I think there was the valuation of sterling. And one of the issues that CDB face was having regard to the provisions of its charter, what would be the impact of the devaluation of the British pound on those currencies in CDB's borrowing, in CDB's member countries, which, whose currencies were linked to sterling at the time. And in the discussion at in our, when it was being discussed in, in, in the meeting, the then treasurer at the time, I, can't, I think he was from Trinidad and Tobago, um, got the first two, in fact, the first three treasurers of the bank were from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, they couldn't, and the they seemed to be not, there was a great concern about whether the bank's currency holdings would take a big hit as a result of the sterling devaluation. And I remember saying to Sir Arthur that the provisions in the charter, well, at least I said to the meeting, which was chaired by Sir Arthur, the provisions of the charter clearly indicated that payment of subscriptions to the bank's capital had to be made in gold or a fully freely convertible currency. And therefore, if a member, if, and this was mainly about the East Caribbean um, countries, including Barbados at the time, that if payment was made in a currency which was not fully convertible, then the subscription had not been properly paid, and therefore the, the member country could be called on to make the payment in the proper way in accordance with the charter. The meeting broke up and we went to lunch, and I was asked to go to the university library at Cave Hill to check some of the laws relating to the, what was legal tender and currency in some of the member countries, because CDB had not at that time built up its own library. And so when I came back, um, Sir Arthur had asked me to come to see him, and he said that it was only when he was at lunch that the significance of the advice I had given sort of registered that the bank was really not exposed because unless the, the payment had been made in the proper currency, then the member country continued to be liable to make the payment. So the bank was unlikely to be affected by the, to suffer a loss as a result of the devaluation of sterling. On, on another occasion, um, the bank was expecting was to be visited by a delegation from West Germany at the time, when, because it was West Germany, the East and West Germany, if this was from West Germany. The bank secretary was ill, and he said that he wanted a, something prepared to, because the Germans are very particular about how institutions they dealt with were managed, and he wanted if I could prepare something setting out how CDB was managed and, and how the various departments and so on function, which I did. And he, uh, after he read it, he said, but you, you make this institution seem like such a well-managed <laughs> and, uh, and well-organized institution. 
And he said, well, in fact, the Germans were so impressed that they immediately said this is the sort of institution that they would like, they'd be willing to deal with. And when they got back to Germany, I think it was on the basis of that that we got the, the loan from KFW. I think it was, um, I can't remember the German name, but that was it. So the point I'm making, so Arthur was a hard taskmaster, but if he felt that you had done well, he was willing to praise. Um, he also sometimes expressed to me his frustration with the board of directors. And he, he once said to me that after a meeting of the board, because at that time, um, when he was president, it was only the, the only other members of staff who would attend meetings would be the bank secretary and the vice president. I don't think that Sir Arthur have ever felt the need to have staff come in to support him in when he chaired meetings of the board. And in fact, some directors confessed that they were so overawed by Sir Arthur that whatever he wanted, then they would accept. Anyhow, he ex obviously there'd been a meeting at which something, um, I think he was, he must have found it difficult to get some point across. And so Arthur, one of his qualities was that he could easily express and communicate the most intricate or complex ideas in very simple terms. And he said to me about one particular director, and this was a director from one of the regional countries, that director has a brain the size of a pea. <laughs> and I began to reflect afterwards that I remembered that the director did have a very small head. <laughs> but then I said to myself, there's no necessary correlation between the size of a person's head and his intellectual capacity. But um, so Arthur could be very um, caustic in his criticisms. And he was obviously venting his um, his frustration at the difficulty encountered on that um, occasion. So I started off by referring to Sir Arthur's insistence on protecting the bank from political pressures in its operations. And throughout his tenure as president, Sir Arthur made, always made a point of making it clear that in keeping with the provisions of the Charter, political considerations were not to be taken into account in the lending operations of the bank. And there was a famous occasion early in the years of the bank when um, a minister in one of the East Caribbean countries was very rude and and virtually chase bank staff out of his office because they wouldn't agree to consider something that he wanted done. The next occasion that Sir Arthur was making a public address, he referred to this, and I think it was on that occasion that he made this statement that the, the lay public tends to think of a bank as a place that lends money, whereas they should really think of, really a bank as a place that can borrow money. If a bank ceases to be able to borrow, then it can't lend and it will go out of business. <laughs> I can't recall exactly what Arthur said in the, about the minister who had been rude to bank staff, but within a week, the minister had lost his job. So he was a very 
strong protector of the staff of the bank when it came to attempts for pressure to be put on them. So Arthur was also not just, he, he, he also was concerned not just about getting the staff to produce, but he was also very much interested in their welfare and in encouraging social contact. I, so that what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to convey this evening is the human side of Sir Arthur as the president of the bank in the early years. He established uh, procedures, principles, and rules and regulations which have served the bank well, as others have referred to. But I would not um, like to leave you with the impression that Sir Arthur was what some would refer to as a stuffed shirt. Sir Arthur could be very funny, he could be very witty, he could be even risque in some of the things he jokes he made and so on. And to give you an example, sometimes either he or Lady Lewis um, would telephone either to meet and speak to me or my wife and say, well, if you're not doing anything this evening, would you like to come and have dinner? And sometimes he would tell you who the guests, if there were going to be other guests. And I remember one occasion, my wife and I went to dinner and the other guests were Errol Barrow and his wife. And I can't remember if there were others there at the time, but so Arthur was that one, you know, at the head of the table, Carolyn Barrows on his right, I was on his left, opposite her. Lady Lewis was at the other end, Errol Barrow on her right, and my wife on her left. And at the end of dinner, Sir Arthur said to me, do you notice that Carolyn was fiddling with that large brooch on her dress, which was strategically positioned to conceal what would now be called a display of cleavage. <laughs> so I said, yes, I noticed it. <laughs> and I was wondering if she was uh, nervous, but she didn't seem to be nervous during the dinner. He said, yes, he was watching it very carefully and hoping. <laughs> hoping that it would fall off and everything, <laughs> and everything would be displayed. So I end on this note just to let you know that he was no stuffed shirt. He was a brilliant economist. He, had, he came to CDB having estab already established his reputation. He did great wonders for CDB, but he was a very human person. And it's been my pleasure to give you some reflections on the other side of South. Thank you very much.